Hi, my name is Matthew Turk, and I am uh, delighted to give a talk today at uh, the uh, CROSS workshop on data across boundaries. Um, I'm at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois. Uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. I am completely honored to participate in this. Um, as a little bit of background, I'm a computational astrophysicist by training. Um, I developed simulation platforms and analysis tools for computational astrophysics. And I've worked in interdisciplinary applications, uh, and I study community practice in open source scientific software. And currently, I'm tenure track at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois, where I'm working to develop and implement a grammar of volumetric analysis. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce why we might be interested in studying data storytelling, uh, what we've learned, how we might be applying that, uh, and some of the theory and practice and why it's important. Uh, I want to give credit to uh, folks that I've worked with, uh, particularly here at the University of Illinois, like uh, Sam Walkow, uh, who's going to show up uh, during this talk, as well as uh, my colleague, Professor Kate McDowell uh, at the School of Information Sciences, uh, as well as uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that's being done in the YT community, uh, which is made up of a large community of users and developers uh, and uh, is uh, overseen by a steering committee, uh, the names of which I put up here. So before I get too far in, I want to give a cartoon history of the universe in order to situate us here where we are in the universe. Um, after recombinations, when the universe had expanded, the electrons had, uh, the, all the free electrons had gone back onto their atoms. Um, the universe was in a nearly but not completely homogeneous state, um, seeded with instabilities and few residual electrons. Uh, then early on, dark matter clumps collected, formed halos that drew in baryonic material, uh, which converted potential energy into thermal energy, which heated this baryonic matter, which then shed the thermal energy through radiative processes. Uh, these then collapse, become fully molecular through three-body interaction, form an accretion disk, and then ultimately we get a star. Um, in an environment absent of heavy elements, the mechanisms which gas can cool are very limited. In particular, uh, the principal coolant is molecular hydrogen, which forms by electron association and then through three-body interactions. So you might have a couple atoms of hydrogen that hit, form a molecule, uh, and then one of them acts as a catalyst and gets spit back out. Um, this begins in an excited state, then collisionally de-excites, spins off, and heats the gas. You might be wondering why I'm setting the stage like this, uh, and I want to say that it's because I want to uh, set the, the boundary so that we understand where we're talking when we say, uh, when we talk about visualization and analysis. I like to start with a quote from uh, one of my favorite people, Stuart Levy, that we tell lies to visualize. Um, this is a statement that uh, perhaps requires some unpacking, but let's imagine that we were to say that the sky is full of stars that twinkle. And in our minds, we imagine this. Uh, we imagine the sky, we draw a box here. Um, maybe it's dark out, I guess it must be if we're looking at the stars. Uh, it is then full of stars. Uh, those stars we can imagine in our, uh, in our mind's eye as you know, perhaps pulsating or something uh, that we then say that these stars twinkle. They grow up and down. And when we look out at those, our eye is interpreting what we see and it is telling us some subset of information about the, uh, the data that uh, reflects the physical characteristics of the system. Uh, in fact, when we look at telescope observations, this is a famous telescope observation, uh, those telescope observations uh, are filtered through the, pro the data processing methods that pr uh, produce something that is suitable for human eyes to see and look at. So we've got an eye and you know, our nebula is shooting out rays of light. Those rays of light maybe get to our eye and then our eye, through its rods and cones, interprets them through different uh, you know, sensitivity functions and so on, converts that into something that our neural cortex can see, our visual cortex can uh, process and interpret, and that we then uh, ascribe information to, uh, that we ascribe some sort of a model to. So when we think about this from the reverse direction, the universe, uh, broadly speaking, can be thought of as being made up of a number of different rules and components. And when I set the stage earlier on with the dark matter and so on, uh, what I was doing was attempting to convey some of the initial conditions and some of the rules uh, that we often go through when we are simulating astrophysical phenomena. Uh, and I like to have these pictures up because uh, they're really pretty and they show uh, how clouds can ref uh, uh, how we can identify clouds uh, that are connected to, say, simulation inputs. So we know how fluid flows, and these are some equations of fluid motion. And in principle, we know if we know 
how uh, gas and fluid move, and we know exactly what they're made up of, and we know the different rules, we could, in principle, toss all of that into a box and then turn the crank on the side of the box. But we then need to interpret that. So, for example, we can toss all of our fluid flows in here, uh, we can update our uh, simulation over time, and then we can watch as it changes and evolves, and then we can correlate that with some piece of information that we see or observe in the natural uh, world. So, in this way, we can connect both the forward and the inverse problems uh, that we are, we are interested in understanding. But when people are doing this, what uh, exactly do they do? When somebody simulates uh, a, a, phenom a natural phenomenon, what exactly do they do then to understand it? What stories do they tell themselves? So Sam Walkow has been conducting an investigation into this data storytelling process by which people describe how they find, uh, clarify, and then communicate stories from their data to themselves. So our understanding of this process of visualization, uh, the semantically meaningful models and so on, and how people understand data will outlast any single tool or platform. And so by understanding this, uh, we can hopefully set the groundwork for building the next generation of tools and platforms. So as an example, Sam has uh, spoken with a number of different researchers that look at how uh, clouds collapse, expand, uh, what ends up happening inside those clouds and how we can interpret that information. Uh, and then we, uh, she's broken that down into a number of different fundamental steps. And it's from this set of fundamental steps that we hope to be able to uh, construct a grammar of data storytelling and uh, volumetric analysis. Now, Coupled with all of this is the notion that storytelling is not an act uh, that is done in isolation. Uh, drawing on the ontology, uh, the framework that uh, Kate McDowell uh, has described, um, we can think of three components in a data storytelling triangle, and we can reframe those inside the uh, context of analyzing data, and particularly how we can then abstract that for understanding how data analysis is, con is conducted independent of the field within which it is uh, it is initialized. So there are three components. There's the storyteller. So for instance, uh, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. There's the tale, uh, which is the underlying information uh, that is shared with us. And then there is the audience. And each one of these components has an independent relationship with the other components. So the story has a relationship with the storyteller. I am standing here, uh, there, is, there is a piece of software, for instance, that exists as a storyteller. It is querying the data, and then it connects with me, the audience of this data story. And it is through my relationship with the software that I understand it better and that I build my own independent relationship with an understanding of the underlying data. This triangle can guide us in how we think about the different processes and how to uh, guide our processes to maximize our ability to understand data. Um, there are, for instance, three different potential categories of visualization. Visualizations we make for ourselves, where we are talking directly to the teller. Visualizations we make for our peers, where we emphasize communicating information about the tale. And visualizations that we make for everyone else. We where we emphasize uh, the told, the audience. We emphasize that as the key component of this. Um, and each of these brings with it different needs for narrative, interactivity, control, and the visual language. But what we've identified is we have identified essentially four different components of uh, data analysis uh, that we, we see in the natural sciences that are, uh, uh, roughly speaking, volumetrically organized. The process of registration, the process of transformation, the process of selection, and then the process of reduction. So for instance, registration is where data is laid out on disk in some manner that may or may not uh, correspond to the spatial organization or the physical meaning of what it represents. And we want then to be able to organize that into some sort of a logical structure where we can apply uh, information that relies on connectivity, position, and so forth. Uh, and then taking that logical structure, be able to map that into some form of a coordinate system where we have an actual spatial structure that corresponds to uh, a metric that we can then apply and can, uh, 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 calculate distances, for instances. Now, one key aspect of this is that with this registration, we can query fields at any specific location. We can define a function that uh, pr provides to us field values. 
Now, this can also be with discretely sampled data. Uh, so for example, you may have some data set that requires integration over multiple different nearby components in order to compute the value at any given location uh, with a smoothing kernel or something like that. The next phase uh, in our vocabulary of volumetric data analysis is that of transformations, where we store some subset of the variables that uh, exist in potentia on a disk, or we measure some subset. But from those, we can then uh, construct any number of fields that exist uh, in, in potentia. So by registering the data, we can combine things at fixed spatial locations with this closure function. So for instance, we might be able to apply an arithmetic manipulation to take two uh, x and y, to take an x field and a y field for velocity, and then construct a velocity magnitude field from them. The velocity magnitude field does not exist on disk, but it exists uh, in uh, theory in potentia. The next phase is that of selection, where we can select uh, points based on either their characteristics or their uh, uh, positions in space. And so we can then apply this as some sort of geometric or non-geometric selector function that we can then utilize on our registered data in order to perform transformations uh, and then finally uh, reductions. Reductions are reductions along axes. So for instance, uh, integration along uh, an axis, uh, com connecting a path, uh, identifying a non-trivial manifold and doing uh, spatial remapping and so forth. For instance, this might be taking a uh, tracer particle and then evolving it through some calculation and then integrating all of the values along which it, uh, it progresses. This can also be, for instance, querying uh, a projection, so constructing simulated observations of galaxy clusters and so on, uh, where we uh, integrate along uh, a spatial plane and then construct a pixel plane that we can then use to, uh, to interpret. And then finally, all of these operations can be composed. Uh, so for instance, we can start with a whole bunch of bits on disk. We can compose them into a registered simulation uh, that, or a registered set of data that uh, has extent in three dimensions and position in three dimensions, um, which also then uh, we are able to select. So for instance, identifying uh, different regions that are overdense in dark matter or in baryonic matter uh, inside this galaxy cluster. Uh, to identify uh, dark matter halos, then taking those dark matter halos, uh, stripping them out, uh, and then remapping them into a new plane where we can conduct uh, you know, uh, uh, reduced data analysis operations on them. We've implemented much of this inside a volumetric analysis platform called YT, uh, which is a Python, Cython, uh, and Rust package that, uh, well, not very much Rust, but uh, that builds out a high-level semantic method for querying fields and APIs that is independent of the underlying data representation on disk. So for instance, drawing from a couple dozen different uh, simulation codes, being able to read and spatially locate different data sets, uh, conduct analysis, visualization uh, on them. Uh, each one of these three images um, is conducted using a completely different method for data uh, analysis and simulation. So I'm sorry, uh, for data representation. So for instance, on the left, this is a uh, an Eulerian grid structure that's adaptive. In the middle is an adaptive Lagrangian Eulerian structure uh, that is essentially an unstructured mesh Voronoi tessellation. And then on the right, a mesh-free simulation using the Gamer2, Arepo, and Gizmo data outputs. And then utilizing this vocabulary of uh, volumetric data analysis, we are able to address these in a uniform way and construct plots that can be directly compared despite their myriad differences uh, in the, the data sets themselves. Um, we can also then uh, construct uh, analysis queries that are specific to the, the physical characteristics rather than computationally oriented systems uh, and abstract away all of the underlying data representation while still making it accessible if necessary. Um, largely, YT is used by Astro Simulators, but uh, it is increasingly now being used by material science, geophysics, and geodynamics, and nuclear engineering, uh, and then a little bit in some other domains. Uh, we're working to uh, expand our understanding of these things, so specifically focusing on the story rather than the technicality, and that's how I think that the tools for data analysis across boundaries should be focused uh, in, in the future. And then how this seeps into our thinking about differential equations, simulation platforms, and the connection from data to knowledge to information to wisdom uh, in connection with theory. 
And then this allows us to address the boundaries between semantics and pragmatic applications. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I look forward to the panel discussion.